We are in the middle of one of the biggest moments in Tesla's history, and it appears Elon is back in fighting form and ready to be a wartime CEO once again. Elon recently changed his profile picture on X, showing the word auto in front of his hands. Many are having fun suggesting it's an Easter egg by Elon that he's now going full force on RoboTaxi and perhaps calling it auto. After the massive layoffs and both Drew Beglino and Roshan Patel quitting, Tesla investors are wanting to understand what happened. One of the most likely is that Tesla's undergoing major change and a shakeup was needed. So I've got Hans Nelson joining us. He has his own YouTube channel called Hans T. Nelson. And uh, we're going to walk us through um, all the new events that happened recently and what we think, why this might have happened. Thank you, Hans. Thanks for having me, Herbert. First, let's start off with some of the key things that happened just recently. You've got Elon, of course, saying this um, a few days ago, right when the layoffs happened and, uh, and Drew and Roshan had made their announcements. And he said, about every five years, we need to reorganize and streamline the company for the next phase of growth. Uh, this, of course, is proven uh, because it's not the first time that Tesla has cut off, uh, you know, gotten major layoffs. That's part of the process. But certainly we are going through major phase of growth. But this is the interesting part. <laughs> he changed his profile picture on X to this. And it's got his, this is a picture that comes from the Walter Isaacson book, number one. And it has the word auto in it. And it's on top of his hands, in front of his hands. So somebody said, oh, that's nothing. Christopher Sanders, there's no hidden meaning here behind the word auto in Elon's profile photo. It's just an artifact from screenshotting an image in the edit mode on Apple. So if you're using the iPhone, you want to edit something, the word auto appears. And so he just showed his son and it's got the word auto there. Sorry, conspiracy theorist, not today. And he laughs. But Elon replied to him, said, I left it there on purpose. <laughs> What's your thoughts on that? What do you think happened, Hans? Yeah, Elon obviously does enjoy giving Easter eggs and hints. Um, one of the things that it made me think about was, you know, it being a screenshot of the Walter Isaacson biography, um, I immediately went back to the book and thought about the whole section on robo-taxis that Walter Isaacson wrote. And so, you know, there's this chapter here, it's chapter 80, and in it, we see uh, that Elon is kind of going back and forth with his executive team. Um, and he's thinking about, okay, we've got this robo-taxi concept. Do we keep the uh, project alive to also sell a version that has steering wheel and pedals or not? And um, yeah, so... I think all of this is important context to just bring forward at this point in time. And so we're going to go ahead and do you want me to read this sure. um, yeah. for us? Okay, so this is uh, Elon Musk saying, we are all in on autonomy. Self-driving cars, Musk believed, would do more than merely free folks from the drudgery of driving. They would, to a large extent, eliminate the need for people to own cars. The future would belong to the robo-taxi a driverless vehicle that would appear when you summoned it, take you to your destination, then ride off to the next passenger. <laughs> Some might be owned by individuals, but most would be owned by fleet companies or Tesla itself. That November, Musk gathered his top five lieutenants in Austin to brainstorm his future over an informal dinner at the half-finished house of Omid Afshar, who hired a private chef to cook super thick aged ribeye <laughs> steaks. Present were Franz von Holshausen, Drew mm. Baglino, uh, Lars Moravi and Zach Kirkhorn. They decided that the Robo Taxi would be smaller, less expensive, less speedy car than the Model 3. Our main focus has to be volume, Musk said. There is no amount that we could possibly build that will be enough. Someday we want to be at 20 million a year. Okay, wait, so, so pause for a second there. Because that, that was an interesting comment he just made there. Because I had uh, been hearing from many people saying that if you were to build the robo taxi instead of the model three or other cars you don't need to build 20 million you just need a hundred thousand to build to service uh chicago so i didn't uh, thank you for reminding me that this is what he said yep a central challenge was figuring out how to design a car with no steering wheel or pedals that could meet government safety standards and handle special situations week after week musk weighed in on every detail what if someone forgets to shut the door of the robo taxi when they get out he asked we have to make sure it can shut its own doors. How would a robo-taxi get into a gated community or a parking garage? 
Maybe it needs an arm that can punch a button or take a ticket, he said. But that seemed like a nightmare. Perhaps we just exclude it from places that you can't easily drive into, he decided. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At times, the conversations were so earnest and detailed, they belied how wild the entire concept was. <laughs> but the end, but by the end of summer 2022, Musk and his team realized they had to make a final decision on the issue they had wrestled with for a year. Should they play it safe and build in a steering wheel, pedals, side mirrors, and other things that were currently required by regulation? Or should they build it to be truly autonomous? Most of his engineers were still pushing for the safer alternative. They had a more realistic outlook on how long it would take for full self-driving to be ready. At a fateful and dramatic meeting on August 18th, which note mm -hmm. is um, only 10 days mm -hmm. after the August 8th date that we have coming up, uh, they gathered to hash the issue out. We want to make sure we are assessing the risk with you, Von Holtzhausen told Musk. If we go down a path of having no steering wheel and FSD is not ready, we won't be able to put them on the road. He suggested that they make a car that had a steering wheel and pedals that could be easily removed. Basically, our proposal is to bake them in right now, but remove them when we are allowed to. Musk shook his head. The future would not get here fast enough unless they forced it. Small ones, Von Holzhausen persisted, which we can remove pretty easily in design around. No, Musk said. No, no. There was a long pause. No mirrors, no pedals, no steering wheel. This is me taking responsibility for this decision. The executive sitting around the table hesitated. Uh, we will come back to you on that, one said. <laughs> yeah. Musk got into one of his very cold moods. Let me be clear, he said slowly. Exactly. This vehicle must be designed as a clean robotaxi. We're going to take that risk. It's my fault if it messes up but we are not going to design some sort of amphibian frog that's a halfway car. We are all in on autonomy. A few weeks later, he was still jazzed about that decision. On his plane flying from dropping Griffin off at college, he joined the weekly robo-taxi meeting by phone. As always, he tried to instill a sense of urgency. This will be a historically mega-revolutionary product, he said. It will transform everything. This is the product that makes Tesla a $10 trillion company. People will be talking about this moment in a hundred years. Okay, so let's pause for a second here. So first of all, this is um, excerpts from Walter Isaacson's book on his biography, Elon Musk. You've got to take a look at this book. It's fantastic. It's a great. Um, it's a great book. I mean, he Walter Isaacson is just an amazing author. Is able to truly get to the details, but tells the story so well. And he doesn't do fluff. He just goes right to the point, as you can tell there. Um, what I find interesting about that one is that they were talking about this in 2022 and they were doing every detail in 2022. So this is now 24, this is two years later. And, you know, people think they're just now figuring things out. They'd already figured a lot of it out. And then secondly, I like the way that he remind you reminded us that, you know, RoboTaxi is an for, uh, autonomy first designed. It's He didn't want it to be just take out the pedals and wheels. I've been having this debate with a lot of people in the last few days. Can't you just make the model, the compact car, and then just take the wheels, uh, steering wheel off? That's, that's it's not, it's, it might have the same outer shell, but the inside's going to be completely different. And that's what I've been trying to um, stay on track. Yeah. Yep. I think it's interesting because the, you know, the, image that is at the beginning of that uh chapter doesn't look like a clean sheet design it looks like a design where you could have mm -hmm. you know a mm -hmm. steering wheel and pedals but then if you go into the meat of the the chapter it, it seems like this image and the situation that's being described in the chapter don't necessarily match and obviously one of the things that walter has told us specifically is that you know this is an early early concept. And so there's a lot of development that occurred after this point in time and we don't know exactly what that looks like. And so yeah, the you know the four seat versions or the six seat versions or you know there's a whole number of different ways that a vehicle could take shape beyond this um that we have as yet to see. So I did want to say so that's you know that was where they ended that conversation at that point in time. But then there's more to the rest of this story. 
Mm-hmm. And so, it, you know, it kind of picks up and it goes on. And I think this sets up a good tension for where we are today. So we'll, we'll pick up at uh, the section, the $25,000 car, because this is kind of the heart of a lot of the reporting that's been happening recently by Reuters, by Electric, uh, by a number of other people. So as the robotaxi discussion showed, Musk could be fiercely stubborn. He had a reality distorting willfulness and readiness to run roughshod over naysayers. This steeliness may have been one of the superpowers that produced his success, along with his flameouts. But here's a lesser known trait. He could also change his mind. He could take in arguments that he seemed to be rejecting and recalibrate his risk calculations. And that is what happened with the steering wheels. At the end of summer of 2022, after Musk had made his pronouncements about being all in on RoboTaxi with no steering wheel, von Holzhausen and Moravi set about persuading him to cover his bet. They knew how to do it in a non-challenging way. We brought him new information that maybe he wasn't fully digesting in the summer, Moravi said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even if self-driving vehicles were approved by regulators in the U.S., he argued, it would be years before they were approved internationally. So it made sense to build a version of the car with a steering wheel and pedals. Mm -hmm. For years, they had talked about what should be Tesla's next generation offering, a small, inexpensive mass market car for selling are selling for around $25,000. Musk himself had teased the possibility in 2020, but then he put a hold on those plans over the next two years. And he repeatedly vetoed the idea, saying that the robotaxi would make the other car unnecessary. Nevertheless, von Holtzhausen had quietly Mm. kept it alive as a shadow project in his design studio. Late on a Wednesday evening during his September 2022 trip to launch Optimus, Musk ensconced himself in his longtime haunt, the windowless Jupiter conference room of the Fremont factory. Moravi and von Holtzhausen led a few top members of the Tesla team in for a secretive meeting. They presented data showing that in order for Tesla to grow at 50% a year, it needed to have an inexpensive small car. The global market for such a car was huge. By 2030, there might be up to 700 million of them almost twice as many as for the Model 3 and Y category. Then they showed that the same vehicle platform and the same assembly lines could be used to make both the $25,000 car and the robo-taxi. We convinced him that if we build these factories and we have this platform, we could churn out both robo-taxis and a $25,000 car, okay. all on let's, the same uh, vehicle architecture. Yeah, let's pause there for a second. Let's chat about that. So um, this idea that they're going to build the 25,000 car, and he specifically even said, right, to hit the 50% growth target. That was what uh, that's what they're still trying to do. So in order to do that, so this is, you know, we'll, we'll do another show on this, uh, where we're going to talk about how likely is it that they're going to be able to hit some sort of growth target. There's many different ways. So we'll talk about that. But um Okay, great that he actually uh, explained that bit. Okay. So after the meeting, Musk and I sat alone in the conference room, and it was clear that he was unenthusiastic Mm -hmm. about the $25,000 car. Mm -hmm. It's really not that exciting of a product, he said. His heart was in transforming transportation through robo-taxis. But over the next few months, he got increasingly more enthusiastic. At a design okay. review session one afternoon in February of 2023, von Holthausen put models of both the RoboTaxi and the $25,000 car next to each other in the studio. Both had a Cybertruck futuristic feel, and Musk loved the designs. When one of these comes around the corner, he said, people will think they are seeing something from the future. Mm-hmm. The new mass market vehicle, both with a steering wheel and as a RoboTaxi, became known as the Next Generation Platform. Musk initially decided that Tesla would build a new factory in northern Mexico, 400 miles south of Austin, designed from the ground up to build such cars. It would use a completely new manufacturing method that was highly automated. But a problem soon arose in his mind. He had always believed that Tesla's designers and engineers needed to be located right next to the assembly line rather than allowing manufacturing to be done at a remote location. That way, engineers could get instant feedback on how to design innovations that could both improve the car and make it easier to manufacture. This was particularly true for a completely new car and manufacturing process, but he realized he would have trouble getting his top engineers to relocate to the new factory. Tesla engineering will need to be on the line to make it successful and getting everyone to move to Mexico is never going to happen, he told me. 
though in May 2023, he decided to change the initial build location for the next generation cars and robo taxis to Austin, where his own workspace and that of his top engineers would be right next to the new high speed ultra automated assembly line. Throughout the summer of 2023, he spent hours each week working with his team to design each station on the line, finding ways to shave milliseconds off each step in the process. And that's the uh, end of that yeah. chapter. That's a great chapter. Thank you for reminding us. It was important for us to go through that so that we can understand um, the, the history of what happened because we are now at an, another inflection point. And so I think what you're suggesting is that at that time, he was convinced to bring back the Model 2, the compact car. But now, maybe this major shakeup, what was that for? Um, let me share a little bit more about what happened in those last few days. So we also have this guy, Chris, Chris Jang. I told you that Elon has re-entered wartime CEO mode. This scene is familiar to the veterans of the Tesla community. Today, Elon decided to bet the entire company on Robotaxi. Okay, that's his, that's his opinion. I don't know if all in Robotaxi is right or wrong. I don't have the answer. So he goes, Elon re-enters wartime CEO mode. But the interesting thing is that Elon actually liked that post that Chris wrote. Okay, so he just liked this. And is that, does that mean that he's betting the farm on Robotaxi or just the fact that he's going to wartime CEO mode? Um, the other the other bit of information is that uh, Rohan Patel was reached, or TechCrunch reached out to Rohan Patel and they exchanged messages. And they he told TechCrunch that the reason he left Tesla was because of big overall changes at the company. That's all he said. And he goes, don't, don't try to read too much. I don't want to give any more specifics. But that's what he said. Okay, big overall changes. Um, Baglino did not really say anything more about that. So, you know, there's could be the thing. Now, here's a, a Chris Jang also posted this. You know, what is the difference between a wartime CEO and a post, a, a, a peacetime CEO? And this came from the book, The Hard Things About Hard Things by, uh, what is it? Bre uh, who? Ben Horowitz. Oh, ben He's, Horowitz. Uh, yeah, from A yeah. to six, A to Z, A six yeah. and Z. Invest, venture capitalist firm. So a peacetime CEO knows that the protocol, proper protocol leads to winning. Wartime CEO, they violate protocol in order to win. Like this is a really big deal. They got to work hard. Uh, focus on big picture and powers for people to make detailed decisions. And wartime CEO cares about a speck of dust on an NSS if it interferes with a prime directive. Wartime CEO does not, does that, builds high, high builds scalable high volume recruiting machines but also builds HR organizations that can execute layoffs. And that's what you were seeing right now uh, is leads, lets the war define the culture. Interesting. And then there's a whole uh, bit of other things about what a wartime CEO does, um, you know, aims to expand the market, but a wartime CEO aims to win the market. So is that what you're thinking right now too, Hans? Do you think that that's what's happening? Big yeah, changes? it definitely seems like the... There is a massive reorganization going on at Tesla. And, you know, there's a lot of hints that point towards the fact that Elon is really focused, like we said, really on, on the first portion of that chapter, that FSD is now becoming real, that up until this point, they have been pursuing an either or, or just a both and, it's not an either or, but a both and strategy for the the $25,000 compact vehicle and the robo taxi. And because up to this point, they've been pursuing that both strategy. I think he has the flexibility to really shift gears and to prioritize the robo taxi platform, given the progress that they are seeing on full self-driving and uh, his confidence is, you know, both inspiring on the one hand, but also nerve wracking on the other, because if there are miscalculations that are made at this point in time, they really could be catastrophic. Uh, but he has an incredible track record on executing on these types of large bets. And um, even if they take a little bit longer to come to fruition, he has been able to do impossible things like this repeatedly. And this is kind of the place that it looks like he is again, that, you know, he is fully engaged in 
the challenges that Tesla is facing right now. And, you know, one of the other things that I wanted to to note is that it seemed like Lars and Franz were kind of leading the charge on mm. the keeping the $25,000 vehicle around that had the steering wheel and pedals. And they are both still at the company. And, you know, Rohan and Drew are not mentioned here in this chapter as being, you know, strong proponents one way or the other. And so, you know, I would not necessarily interpret the departure of Rohan and Drew as necessarily being because they don't believe in the future that Elon has laid out that could be a contributing factor. Uh, But it's definitely not something that we can know for sure. But They've also both been longtime executives. And one of the things that I guarantee you right now is that if Elon is in wartime CEO mode, then that means all of his executives need to be personally prepared for the sacrifices that are required to be in wartime company operations mode, which is high intensity, high output, extremely focused, high sacrifice, um, all in presence at the company. And that, you know, they are expecting to be under attack, basically, as a company, as they make this transition to whatever this next phase is. And so, understandably, before you go into a operating environment like that, you want to make sure that everyone that is in a key role is all in and up for that type of a challenge. And based on comments that both Drew and Rohan made, you know, they have been highly engaged at Tesla for a long time. And both of them feel like it's time in this season of their lives for them to focus a little bit more on their family. Um, You know, obviously, those are comments that people make in a transition like this because it is something that weighs on their mind. Um, But I think that that really is the main reason for those two departures specifically is that they're being asked to commit to a higher level of presence and engagement in Tesla. And it's not something that they're personally in a position where they feel like they need to or want to or have the bandwidth uh, to do that. And that is completely okay. You know, Tesla has a very deep bench and there are incredible people that are behind them who can step into these roles, just like you know, Drew has done a fantastic job of filling the shoes of J.B. Straubel. I expect there to be great people to replace both him and Rohan as well. Yeah, you know, yesterday, the days before that, uh, people were saying something similar to what you were saying, and I wasn't buying it. I was thinking to myself, well, you know, that's a common reply by executives. I'm going to spend more time with my children. But the difference here, and I'm buying it now, I'm actually listening to this because I think that the difference is that, um, you know, Elon loves conflict. He loves to create sense of urgency and he will make bold decisions. And you can see in that excerpt you wrote about what happened two years ago, he was already ready to make it then. So when he does this, there's going to be major upheaval and he wants a huge sense of urgency and maybe some people are saying, you know, I, this, he's going to demand a lot. He's already demanding a lot. And I don't know if I want to do it right now because it's a major change. So let me um, share a little bit of the email he sent to the staff announcing the layoffs. And I won't read all of it, but parts of it is over the years, we have grown rapidly with multiple factories scaling around the globe with this rapid growth. There's duplication roles and job functions. And then um, as we prepare for our next phase of growth, So he's been saying this, right? He's been saying this quite often. There's a next phase of growth that we're going to do. We need to look at every aspect. Um, And then I'm just going to skip right back to this. It says, for the people who are remaining, I would like to thank you in advance for the difficult job that remains ahead. We're developing some of the most revolutionary technologies in auto energy and artificial intelligence. As we prepare the company for the next phase of growth, your resolve will make a huge difference in getting there. So Hans, do you think that, uh, you know, this is not only this idea that we're going to go into robotaxi, which, no, you know, we don't know yet if that's, that's you know, confirmed or not, but it sure looks like that he's prioritizing robotaxi very likely because he's announced 8.8. The cars, the FSD seems to have improved significantly. 
But it's not that it, the people didn't leave because, oh, I'm going to do RoboTaxi instead of the compact car. But it's it's more like I'm, we're going to have a massive change in the company. We're no longer going to be a hardware company per se. We're going to be a software subscription company, AI, RoboTaxi. These are things that are going to take us. We're going to need to make a wholesale change in how we value certain parts of the company. There's already rumors that he wanted that people with AI skills and developers, they need to give them a lot more compensation and package. So um, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that, you know, people have been saying that Elon is distracted with Twitter slash X for a long time. And, you know, there's some legitimate critique to be had there. I think that he is now... Um, moving into a phase where he's going to be devoting the type of energy to Tesla and moving this mission forward that he has been devoting to X for a while. And, you know, one of the things that he did when he got to X was just immediately restructure and reorganize the company. And he demanded a level of hardcore dedication from those remaining employees that uh, was, you know, completely just a shift and departure from what the culture of Twitter was previously. So, you know, that's going to be a lot more of a dramatic transformation when you're coming into a company that doesn't have that type of culture to begin with and you're, you know, moving in a completely new direction. But that said, you know, Tesla has a lot of the cultural values that Elon has instilled in the company all throughout its history. Um, and so it's not going to be as big and dramatic of a shift that's required. Uh, you know, he's not going to downsize Tesla by 80% like he did at Twitter either, but he is kind of entering that, that, I mean, that's part of, you know, we've seen what wartime CEO looks like at X over the last couple of years. Now that type of mentality has returned to Tesla. This is the intensity that we're going to be looking at moving forward. This is the focus that we're going to be looking at moving forward. This is the cohesiveness that is going to be expected moving forward. And it is focused on a combination of, you know, both execution on hardware, but really execution on the software layer above the hardware that's going to unlock, unlock dramatically different types of margin structures and business models than we've seen in the past. And remember back to the comment that he said, you know, people are yeah. going to be talking about this decision years and yeah. years from now. This is the thing that transforms the company into a $10 trillion company. And world. that is still yeah. the way that he is thinking about yeah. where they are at right now is they are transforming Tesla. They're doing, you know, becoming a $10 trillion company is not something that happens overnight. It takes a lot of intentional thought and planning and work to prepare all of the pieces that are nest like they have to get the software right they have to get the hardware right they have to get the supply chain right they have to get you know a whole myriad of things set up in order for them to be able to fulfill on that promise and that is where Elon's mind is focused right now is how do we make that happen and there's going to be a lot of blood sweat and tears and also a lot of chaos and volatility between here and there, because the vast majority, you know, if you tell anyone today that in 2030 or 2035, that the world's biggest company is going to be over $10 trillion, 99.9% yeah. .9 of people are going to tell you you're friggin' nuts. Yeah. You're insane. And, um, you know, that is the type of ambition that yeah. Elon has for the company right now. That's, you know, well above a 10x uh, yeah. valuation jump from where we are today. And in order to accomplish something like that, he's said many, many times that it will take incredible effort. It will take incredible execution, but it is within the realm of possibility. And this is like, yeah. And yeah, he's, he's not classic after Elon. The, not just, just the 10th trillion. He's trying to change the world and he's doing that. This is the way to do it. And he sees it. He feels it. He knows it's coming now, as we have all seen with full self-driving progress. He set the stage of 8.8. And now he's going to go, let's go work really, really hard to make all these ambitious. I'm going to push you. Uh, I want to come back to this fun conversation of this, right? So he changed his profile on X to this photo. This is 
the photo that's used in the Walter Isaacson autobiography of him. And so some people are having fun, right? It says the word auto. It's in his hands. <laughs> and it's his biography. So some people are going auto and me, autonomy, <laughs> autonomy. But I love the idea of using the word auto. Isn't that great? Using the word auto. Like instead of Uber, it's auto, right? Hey, why don't you just, I'm going to get an auto and I'm going to get that auto. You know, I'm going to go to whatever. Hail me an auto. Send me, I'll, I'll just take an auto to get there. It makes so much sense. I love the name. Um, I do hope that they choose that name. And it sounds like he's giving you a hint that that's maybe what it is. And then, of course, this whole idea that they've already been talking about this for a long time. By the way, the other thing that I just realized is that maybe it means I'm going to get back to cars. <laughs> mm -hmm. Auto. The auto, you know, no, right? It's autonomy. Not, it's not going to be, it's 8-8 eight, eight, autonomy, not, you know, I'm going to build lots of cars, yeah. auto. It, well, I mean, it's both. You need, you know, you need right. lots of auto, autonomous yeah. autos. So, yeah. yeah, like they are, you know, the con or the, the little excerpt that we saw about, they, he, even in a, an autonomous future, He's still thinking about, you know, selling 20 million vehicles right. a year. Yeah. And it's not that, you know, lithium is one of the things that people have called out as being a constraint on the ability of Tesla to sell 20 million vehicles in 2030. And that could still very well be the case. Um, you know, we'll see how how fast this line can spool up. You know, we may be delayed by several years, but even if we're delayed by several years in being able to deliver 20 million vehicles per year and they are fully autonomous, the types of future that that unlocks all across the globe is insane. And it is going to be a fight like the, you know, the people saying that regulations is going to be a fight. They are 100 percent correct. Um, you know, part of one of the things that I keep leaving open in my mind that you know, I, I love the way that Emmett Peppers thinks about things kind of probabilistically. And um, I would say in my mind, there's also still a significant probability, maybe 30, 40% that while we are shifting priorities now to this autonomous robo taxi fleet, that, you know, this is a, a platform that's going to be manufactured in many of the factories around the world. And that just because we are pulling back on the a steering wheel and pedals, probably in Austin right now for this initial ramp up, that does not mean that other factories are not still going to be producing steering wheel exactly. and pedals vehicles. You know, yeah. Mexico can still produce those vehicles. They could be produced in China. They could be yeah. produced in Berlin. And, yeah. you know, Reuters can accurately see that a specific supplier for a specific set of parts has basically been told, hey, we're shelving that project. And that may still only affect 10, 20, 30% of this plan moving forward. And so, you know, I, yeah. I still think that it's highly likely that we see both versions of the vehicles, even though Elon is kind of right now in his wartime mode, moving ahead very aggressively with the you know the all-in robo taxi um thing and the what it will come down to is just how does the real-time data present itself to him when the real-time data says hey it's not possible for you to accomplish the goals of accelerating the world's transition to sustainable energy if you go too hard into robo taxis and you don't have steering wheel and pedals versions he will pivot like that's how he operates. And so we'll just see how all of that kind of transpires. Exactly. Okay. It sounds great. I mean, uh, 20 million, there's 80 million, well, 80 and hundred million cars on the <clears throat> roads today, old used and new. And they're making what, uh, 10 to 12 million per year. Right. I'm I mean, sorry. No, no, there's 80 million. Yeah. 80 million cars maybe. per year, per year new. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure time. out. Yeah. Yeah. 80 million per year car auto. Okay. Anyways, I mean, my point is that if you, if, if auto robo taxi works, uh, uh, yeah, 80 million motor vehicles manufactured that year globally in 2021. So they can do 20 million 
But if, if it's RoboTaxi, you don't need as many, you need one fifth. But if you're trying to replace all the cars that are existing today, people will just scrap those if you can, if this serves your need, you don't need your old car. And that is why he's trying to do this. this is the fastest way to get things changed. Okay. Ooh, big topic. Thank you for the, walking us through all that. Uh, it was good to revisit the past, a little bit of what's happened, but it's also uh, reassuring that they've been talking about this, figuring out all the details three, three years ago. This is not something that it's only now that he's pushing hard because autonomy is it's right in our fingertips. It truly is. That's why it's in, it's in his, uh, on his hands, right? It's coming closer. Thanks so much, Hans. Appreciate you follow him as a YouTube channel. He's just killing it there. He's got great shows, great interviews, uh, great analysis. Thank you so much. Check him out on his YouTube channel at Hans C. Nelson. Thanks, everybody. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.